Hello everyone, welcome to our next training video, our third last one for the year. I'm looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, but the study is primarily about chapter 8, which we'll be looking at extensively or in this training video, um, the idea of a cheerful giver. And really, I could encourage you to read the passage beforehand, prayerfully consider it before getting for, into this video. Um, of course, you got your leader's notes, which will give you a bit more information. Um, but yeah, let's get going. But looking at the context, very important just to remember there is an historical context to this passage. Um, it's, it's important to remember that Jesus taught his disciples to be generous. If you remember the passage we did in Luke chapter 12 in this series, is Jesus told his disciples, sell your possessions and give to the poor, which is really be generous with what you've got. And when we get to the book of Acts, we actually see the church applying this. They sold property and possessions, notice the link, property and possessions, to give to anyone who had need, the poor. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God. They did this joyfully, this sharing of one another's resources. But also keeping in mind that it's this generosity, not just helping the poor, but also sending out missionaries and enabling others to be in the ministry like the apostles, Peter, James, John, and so forth. But then, in between chapter two, uh, we and chapter yeah, chapter two and chapter eleven, we read about the church in Jerusalem experiencing a tremendous famine. They were in desperate need. They were in trouble, and so the disciples, those from the Gentile churches, actually throughout the empire, where they were sending out disciples to witness, each one as each one was able, very important qualification, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. And so in many ways, when you read 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, you'll see Paul challenging the Corinthian church to be generous in providing for the generous church of Jerusalem that is now in need. And so he asked them in his first letter that on the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I, have no collect when I come, no collections will have to be made. And the idea here is in advance, the church in Corinthians, each individual, each one of you in that church actually needed to decide what we want to give to contribute to the church of Jerusalem in alleviating their need and enabling them to continue. And so when we read 2 Corinthians, we see it seems that the Corinthian church actually has committed to something, but they haven't finished it yet. And so Paul asks them, finish the arrangements. Notice for the generous gift you had promised or you had pledged to give. And he's really saying, what you have decided, what you said to me you will do, what you've pledged and promised to do, please fulfill it. But notice, very importantly, there's qualifications to this. This gift shouldn't be given begrudgingly or grudgingly, basically given contrary to what they want. They actually want something else, but now they're just giving it because they feel... They have to and they feel begrudged or grudgingly about it. Paul is like, that's not what I want. Or reluctantly, they shouldn't feel pain or sorrow by giving it away or under compulsion, meaning they shouldn't give it because they feel manipulated by Paul. No, they should give what you had decided in your heart. Very important. It's the heart attitude Paul is after. And it's the heart attitude that God loves. God loves a cheerful giver. But how do you become like this? Well, there's a couple of things up to this point before chapter 9 that Paul has been exploring and explaining to the Corinthian church to get them to the place where they can decide in their hearts to give cheerfully this generous gift they've promised. And the first one, of course, is he turns to the church in Macedonia, churches like Philippi. And so he says, and now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that has been given to the Macedonian churches. He uses them as an example to show this is a normal Christian life. Now, very importantly, notice the uniqueness of the Macedonian church. In the midst of a severe trial, they didn't have plenty. Their overflowing joy, notice the idea of cheerfulness there, and the extreme poverty, so the opposite of what you would think, wild up in rich generosity. And then notice how he describes them. They went beyond their ability, so above their own ability, which is above the requirement, they did this entirely on their own. There was no compulsion or manipulation by Paul in any way. 
and they urgently pleaded with us, and they saw it as a privilege of sharing in this service. And they gave themselves first to the Lord. They did it as a worship, as an offering to the Lord, as a sacrifice to God, and then by the will of God also to us. So very importantly, when the call went out to the churches to be generous, this church entirely on their own went above and beyond in rich generosity. They viewed it as a privilege, as worship to God, even though their situation demanded them maybe not to be generous. And so it's very important for us to see this incredible generosity. And looking at them, Paul turns to the church of Corinth and basically says, you excel in this grace of giving. If you remember in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, they were excelling in all sorts of other gifts in faith and speech and knowledge. And, and really he's saying, you need to excel also in this gift of giving. But then he moves on and says, look, it's not just the normal Christian life when you look at the Macedonian church. You need to also realize it's modeled by Jesus. And in fact, generosity is a test. Notice what he says. I want to test the sincerity of your love. It's a test of love. Generosity and love go together. That's very important to see. <laughs> and he says here, because we see the love of God in the generosity of Jesus. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the language that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And that's the gospel. Jesus basically becoming nothing as he wrote to the Philippian church in Philippians chapter 2 verse 6 to 11 and I would encourage you to go there and read it as Jesus emptied himself became nothing pouring himself out literally unto death so that in him we might receive eternal life become rich receive what is Jesus's and that is the measure of love and so in many ways a failure to be generous is a failure to love, and a failure to love is actually a lack of understanding the gospel. And so Paul moves on, and he points out, look, this is the normal Christian life. It's modeled by Jesus. It's a test of your love. But also, when you are generous, A, you're helping those who are in need, and the church in Jerusalem, by the way, could then carry on being the church in Jerusalem and serving but also it enables ministries and you'll see it actually, it actually causes the, the amount of people thanking God and worshiping God to increase. So notice here in verses 13 to 14, a direct application of the gospel, Paul points out that as they have plenty, they can empty themselves out. They can become slightly poorer so that those who are in need, they can provide for them what they need. And so in turn, they will practice the gospel back and give what you need. And so the churches are supposed to be supporting one another in their need, that there might be equality. So it's that idea of alleviating one another's need as a form of gospel generosity. But in chapter 9, verses 6 to 11, he expands on this quite a bit. And so he points out a little principle. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. This has got nothing to do with prosperity gospel, but all to do with gospel ministry. So notice as he continues in these verses, and God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, notice, you will abound in every good work. That's the reap generously is talking about. The good work of ministry, of sharing the good news of Jesus, enabling others to do it as well, and mirroring and modeling Jesus in generosity by helping those in need. And also notice, he says, using, continuing with this idea of reaping and sowing, God will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Both these ideas, by the way, are tied to Paul's ministry. Paul describes his own ministry as Jesus' ministry and act um, as in chapter 6, verse 10, as enriching others with the gospel. And of course, the whole point of the ministry, chapter 5, is to call others to be reconciled to Christ, so that in him, him, in him, they might become the righteousness of God. And so he's pointing out through generosity, we actually partner with God in this ministry. And so we see we are abounding in every good work, we're increasing the harvest of righteousness, and here's a beautiful thing. You will be enriched in every way, so that you can be generous on every occasion. Notice, and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. In the end, because of what they've done, the good works, the increasing in righteousness, the generous giving to the church in Jerusalem, 
more people will be praising God. Or as he puts it in chapter in verse 15, I think, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And that makes it all worth it. But also for us to keep in mind, and Paul reminds them as well, that yes, you're blessing others, but you need to keep in mind, you'll see God's generosity to you in providing for you what you need. So notice the chapter 8 verse 15, he quotes Exodus. The one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. And the point of that is, when you go read Exodus 16, is that God provided for Israel everything they needed to follow him in his word. And Paul's encouraging them and saying, in your generosity, God is using you to provide for others so that they could continue to follow his word and seek his kingdom, but in turn, the same for you. You'll see God providing for you. And here he says it again, God will make sure that you have all that you need. Maybe not everything you want, but definitely all that you need so that you can abound in every good, good work. And so what you want people to walk away with is just understanding the link between being a willing and cheerful generosity and the gospel. They go together. And of course, as we've been learning through the Impossible Command series, you see this link by the power of the Holy Spirit, which you, you could see that in chapter 3. For example, it's the Spirit that unveils this glorious gospel to us so that we would see it and respond to it by being willing and generous in generosity. But also for us as a church family to be challenged, to excel in the grace of giving ourselves as a joyful and willing response to what God has done for us in Christ. There's so much more we can do for our valley, for South Africa, for fellow churches and missionaries. And in many ways, our generosity can grow these things and make an impact, not just for now, but for the future and for eternity. And that's, I would argue, what this passage is about.